In this presentation, we will perform a troubleshooting procedure on a classic external border gateway protocol or EBGP neighbor relationship formation problem, forming an EBGP neighbor relationship between two spokes on a hub and spoke topology. We will form our neighbor relationship between the two spoke routers, R2 and R3. Each of these routers resides in a different autonomous system. Therefore, they will form an EBGP neighbor relationship. Here is the baseline BGP configurations for each router. As you can see, this is the most basic and minimal configuration that can be used with BGP. This configuration was tested on an Ethernet segment and was fully operational. However, when the same configuration is deployed over a hub and spoke frame relay topology, it is no longer operational. By the end of this presentation, we will see that the source of the problem is a time to live or TTL issue related to EBGP. By default, EBGP packets are transmitted with a TTL equal to 1. When an attempt is made to transmit these packets through the hub router in this topology, the TTL will be set to 0. The packets will be dropped and the BGP connection will never form. While this is the problem we will examine, the purpose of this presentation is more about applying a structured troubleshooting methodology that attempts to apply two generally recognized troubleshooting principles. Principle number one. From a methodology perspective, begin your troubleshooting process by testing and verifying basic and foundational processes. Once these processes are verified to be operational, then shift to testing more complex processes. Principle number two. From a usage of Cisco troubleshooting tools perspective, start by using tools such as show and ping tools first. Only when you have exhausted all data from these tools, shift to using the more CPU intensive debug utilities. With these two principles in mind, let us begin to troubleshoot this foundational eBGP neighbor relationship formation process in a structured manner. Let us begin our troubleshooting process by entering the show IP BGP summary command on both R2 and R3. This is always a good starting point for troubleshooting BGP neighbor relationship formation issues. Notice that the state is active on R2. And once again, notice that the BGP state is active on R3 as well. In conclusion, both the peering sessions of R2 and R3 are in the active BGP state. This is both a positive and negative situation. It is positive from the perspective that both routers are attempting to form a BGP peering relationship with each other. It is negative from the perspective that neither can completely form the peering relationship in a successful manner. When the keyword active is listed in the show IP BGP summary table, we do not have an optimal situation. To successfully form a BGP neighbor relationship, a BGP peer must transition the active state and reach the established state. It is worth noting that BGP possesses six different neighbor formation states. They are idle, connect, active, open set, open confirm, and established. Only the established state reflects a fully operational BGP peering session. All other states should be transitional. Reaching the desired established state is reflected in the Show IP BGP summary display with a timer running in the up-down column. Let's take a look. Here is the Show IP BGP summary command and here is the up-down column. Notice here that the timer is 11 hours, 6 minutes and 8 seconds. This is what a fully operational BGP session should reflect a running timer in the up-down column. Now that we have verified that both ends of our eBGP connection are actively attempting to form a peer relationship with each other, but are failing to do so, let us use the Telnet command in a unique way to statically simulate the formation of a BGP connection. Using Telnet in this manner is yet another tool in the Cisco iOS troubleshooting toolkit. Let us use Telnet to connect to the BGP port from one side of this BGP peering relationship and make sure we can confirm the presence of a BGP process on the remote side, in this case R3, by confirming the layer 4 or TCP portion of a BGP connection. So let's go to R2 and let's initiate a Telnet to the well-known TCP port 179 for BGP.
Notice that the command did not return the prompt. It is hanging in the open state. Let's go to R3 and look at its show IP BGP summary output. Notice how the state is now connect. Previously it was active. Let's go ahead and clear this neighbor relationship and try the same thing from R3 to R2. You see that the prompt is returned on R2. Now let's go to R3. Telnet 172.16.12.2, 179, and we see that R2 now maintains the BGP connect state. These tests were successful. We were able to move our BGP peering relationship between R2 and R3 from active to connect. This Telnet test seems to indicate that the BGP processes are fully operational on both ends of the intended peering sessions. Therefore, we can assume that the problem does not lie in the BGP processes themselves. The problem must lie in the transmission of the packets between the two BGP peers. As we move away from using Telnet as a troubleshooting tool for BGP, one point must be stressed. The Telnet session to the BGP port 179 used a TTL that was greater than 1. Therefore, the Telnet tool was unable to detect the actual underlying issue of this problem, which is that eBGP packets, by default, have a TTL of 1. The Telnet packets, again, went out with a TTL of greater than 1. Please remember the following. You must know everything about your troubleshooting tools. Again, you must know everything about your troubleshooting tools. Do not make any false assumptions about your troubleshooting tools. If you do not follow these rules, the tools themselves can generate more problems than they can solve. Now, let's get back to our troubleshooting process. We have determined that the problem preventing the BGP neighbor relationship from forming between R2 and R3 is related to the transmission of the BGP packets between the two eBGP peers. While both of these eBGP peers share the common subnet of 172.16.12/24, it is a special case common subnet, a hub and spoke frame relay subnet, a diagnostic tool that is commonly used to troubleshoot issues in the path between two endpoints is traceroute. The traceroute command will provide a hop by hop list of each router in the path between a given source and destination. When a traceroute is used to determine the path between two devices on a common subnet, that uses an underlying shared media such as Ethernet. The traceroute should return only one entry, the destination device. Let us quickly demonstrate this by running a traceroute between two devices on an Ethernet segment. R3 is maintaining a direct connection with a device with the address of 172.16.34.4. So let's run traceroute to this address. And as we see, only one entry is returned by traceroute. And this is the case because the 172.16.34.4 address is on a common subnet shared with R3. Now with this said, Let's see what happens when Traceroute is run over a single hub and spoke network, like the network to which our two eBGP peers are attached. This output is interesting. We see that there are two hops on this common subnet. This is radically different than the Traceroute performed between the two devices on an Ethernet segment. By using the traceroute tool at this stage in the troubleshooting process to determine what is preventing the formation of the eBGP peer relationship, one can better understand the path between the two BGP peers. As this traceroute indicates, even though this frame relay segment is a local common IP subnet, it still requires packets to be physically forwarded via one router hop for traffic exchange between the two spokes. If the person performing the specific troubleshooting process possesses a solid understanding of IP packet forwarding and an understanding of the general operation of routing protocols, two issues should come to mind after seeing the output of this trace route over frame relay. Issue number one, because there is an extra router hop in this path, 
all IP packets transmitted from spoke to spoke will have their TTL decremented by 2. And, issue number 2, many routing protocols such as OSPF and EBGP transmit their control plane packets with a TTL of 1. Given the understanding of these two facts, and given the output of the trace route, we should be able to resolve the troubleshooting process. It should be obvious to the person performing the troubleshooting that the problem that is preventing the two EBGP peers from forming a neighbor relationship is a TTL issue. However, because the purpose of this video on demand is to highlight a troubleshooting process, let's move forward and collect as much data as we can by using our iOS toolkit to pinpoint the problem. We still have a few more iOS show commands that we can use, and then we will begin to use iOS debug utilities. For now, it is vitally important to remember to use a tool like Traceroute at this step of the troubleshooting process. Now, let us examine some general IP traffic statistics to see whether we can determine what the problem is. Let us enter the show IP traffic command. As can be seen, this command provides lots of information on a range of IP protocols. Going from the very top, it begins with information on general IP statistics, then ICMP and TCP statistics, then BGP, EIGRP, and PIM statistics, then IGMP, UDP, and OSPF statistics, and then finally ARP statistics. We don't need the majority of this information. Let's just focus on three of these sets of statistics, ICMP, TCP, and BGP. While the ICMP statistics of show IP traffic show us a lot of useful information, it gives us no information on any TTL exceeded messages received by ICMP. The TCP statistics are minimally useful, However, it does show that nearly twice as many TCP packets have been sent versus those that have been received, and that will be useful. The BGP statistics are minimally useful here. So, while show IP traffic will be useful in other cases, at this point it has been minimally useful. But it does show us something interesting about TCP. Let's investigate TCP statistics in more detail with another show command. Remember, the purpose of this exercise here is to get you, the CCIE candidate, to be thinking about what show commands can be used in an exhaustive manner before you move on to debug tools. Now, we just took a look at show IP traffic. We will see that in other presentations as being very useful. It's been minimally useful here. Now, let's go ahead and take a look at show TCP statistics. Once again, show TCP statistics is showing us that many more TCP packets have been sent rather than have been received. While this is generally useful, it will be more useful if we clear these statistics and then view them again. So let's go ahead and do that. Now let's run show TCP statistics one more time. Now notice that everything is zeroed out now except one. One TCP packet has been sent. Very likely that is our BGP connection that's attempting to establish a connection with the other side. And this is indicated by the fact that our TCP connection is still in this active state.
And if we wait a few seconds longer, we will see that that will increment. But yet none have been received. Therefore, the show TCP statistics can be useful in troubleshooting BGP problems from a TCP perspective. Well, at this point, it appears that we've exhausted our troubleshooting tools involving Cisco IOS show commands. It's time to consider using some minimally CPU-intensive debug tools. Next, we're going to start with using debug IP BGP to see if we're receiving any useful diagnostic information on this problem. However, before we leave using the show command, it is very important to work with the show commands, learn them, experiment with them to see what information they can give you. And so far, what have we used? Show IP BGP summary, show IP traffic, show TCP statistics. Coupled with that, we also used the telnet command to facilitate traffic. We telneted to the specific BGP port 179. We also used the traceroute command. And in order to get more readable statistics, from show TCP statistics, we did a clear TCP statistics command. So with all that done, let's now move to the debug tools. And we'll start with debug IP BGP. Now with debug IP BGP running, we will statically initiate a BGP neighbor relationship session by running the clear IP BGP command. Let's go ahead and do this. Notice that this procedure of using the clear IP BGP command statically moves the BGP peer formation state from active to idle and then back from idle to active again. After a period of time, the BGP open session process times out and generates the message remote host not responding. And here is that command. Connection timeout, remote host not responding. With this debug output, we now know the following. The BGP process is running on both sides and TCP packets seem to be transmitted out. While this is useful, it still does not provide a complete picture of the problem. Let's enable another debug utility. The Cisco IOS Troubleshooting Toolkit possesses a vast range of debug utilities. Let's enable debug IP ICMP to see if we're receiving any error messages. While the show IP traffic display shows the transmission and receipt of some ICMP error messages, it does not show them all. Let's go ahead and review this one more time. The one error message that we're looking for is the time exceeded error message. And notice it is not in this display. However, when we enable debug IP ICMP, we will see this ICMP error message appear. Let's go ahead and do this. This is interesting debug output. With debug IP ICMP enabled, we are now receiving ICMP TTL exceeded error messages from R1. We see the message, time exceeded, that's the ICMP error message, TTL exceeded, and we see the source, 172.16.12.1, which is router 1. We have now collected explicit data related to the root cause of our problem. While the show IP traffic display does not possess a counter for the receipt of the following ICMP message type, and that is related to the time exceeded ICMP error message. Debug IP ICMP detected the receipt of this ICMP error message. Again, let's take a quick look at the show IP traffic ICMP section. Notice again that there is no field for the time exceed error message. Not here. But debug IP ICMP clearly shows it. This underscores the very logical general troubleshooting strategy we emphasized earlier. 
collect as much data as you can from the Cisco iOS Show command. When all data collection efforts have been exhausted by using the Cisco iOS Show command, then revert to the more CPU intensive debug utilities. In this particular case, Debug IPICMP solved our problem. It uncovered the fact that by default, eBGP sessions transmit packets with a TTL equal to 1. This is due to the assumption stated in RFC 1771 that eBGP sessions are formed on a common subnet. If they are formed on a common subnet, a TTL of 1 will suffice. In this case, the eBGP session was formed on a common subnet. However, it is a very special type of common subnet, a hub and spoke common subnet. In order to forward a packet from one spoke to another, each packet must be received by the hub router interface and then be retransmitted out the same interface. When this is done, the router is performing an IP forwarding operation. According to RFC 1812, the router requirements RFC, whenever a router performs a forwarding operation, it must decrement the TTL by 1. When default eBGP packets are processed by the hub router interface, the TTL is decremented by 1 and is then set to 0. Any packet with a TTL equal to 0 is dropped and the router that processed the packet generates an ICMP TTL exceeded message and transmits it to the source of the packet. This is clearly what was happening. This is clearly proved by the Cisco IOS debug IP ICMP output. Very interestingly, again, the packets were being forwarded from R2 to R3. R1 attempted to forward the packets, decremented the TTL1 to a TTL of 0, and then sent an ICMP TTL exceeded message back to the source. This is indicated here by the IP address 172.16.12.1, which is R1's IP address. This entire problem can be easily remedied with the eBGP multi-op configuration command. This command statically sets the TTL value used by eBGP packets. Let us apply this command on both R2 and R3. Within seconds, the BGP neighbor relationship is up. We can further validate this with the show IP BGP summary command. And notice now that our up down timer column has a value of 33 seconds. This indicates that the connection is up and fully operational. This concludes this presentation. While this presentation reviewed a fundamental eBGP neighbor relationship formation issue, the presentation focused more on highlighting two general principles of common troubleshooting methodologies. Again, these two common principles are principle number one, from a methodology perspective, begin your troubleshooting process by testing and verifying basic and foundational processes. Once these processes are verified to be operational, then shift to testing more complex processes. From a usage of Cisco iOS troubleshooting tools perspective, Start by using tools such as show and ping tools first. Only when you have exhausted all data from these tools, shift to using the more CPU intensive debug utilities. These two principles have been widely used by the majority of engineers working in the Cisco Technical Assistance Center, or TAC, over the last several years. Thank you for viewing this presentation. In this presentation, we will perform a troubleshooting procedure on a classic set of border gateway protocol or BGP routing issues. We will begin this presentation with the assumption that the majority of BGP neighbor relationships are properly formed. There will be only one BGP neighbor relationship issue we will need to deal with. 
All other neighbor relationships are fully operational. Let's take a look at our topology. R2 and R4 maintain an external border gateway protocol or eBGP neighbor relationship. R1 and R2 maintain an internal border gateway protocol or iBGP neighbor relationship. R1 and R3 also maintain an iBGP neighbor relationship. With the exception of the iBGP neighbor relationship between R2 and R1, the other neighbor relationships in this topology are fully operational. Our first task in this presentation will be to fix the one failed iBGP neighbor relationship between R2 and R1. Once we fix this problem, we will then encounter a series of troubleshooting issues related to propagating the 172.16.104.22 prefix that originates in Autonomous System AS200 1R4. This presentation will focus as much on BGP as it does on implementing the following four-step troubleshooting process. Step 1. Learn and master the technology you are troubleshooting. Step 2. Learn and master the troubleshooting tools that you will be using, namely in this case the Cisco IOS troubleshooting tools. Three. Be able to control and predict the behavior of the technology that you are troubleshooting when you apply steps 1 and 2. And then the fourth and final step, after you've completed steps 1 through 3, formulate a structured and consistent troubleshooting approach. With this said, let's begin to address our first troubleshooting issue, which is fixing the IBGB neighbor relationship between R2 and R1. Let's review the configuration scripts for both these routers. From these configuration scripts, we see that the iBGP neighbor relationship is formed between two loopback interfaces on R1 and R2. Also, after viewing these basic BGP scripts, we see that the BGP configuration commands in the scripts are very simple, but are complete. There seems to be no problem with the BGP configurations themselves. With this said, let's review the network diagram again. Given that the configuration scripts look fine, and given the fact that IBGP neighbor relationships are being formed using loopback addresses, let's examine the routing path between R2 and R1. As we can see, it is a very simple path. R2 and R1 share a common subnet between them. We can also see that both R2 and R1 are OSPF neighbors, and they are advertising their loopbacks to each other via OSPF. Given this information, Let's begin our troubleshooting process by applying a simple ping test. If we cannot solve the problem with this simple test, we will move on to performing more complex tests. First, let's make sure that R2 can ping the R1 loopback interface, and that R1 can ping the R2 loopback interface. Let's start by pinging the R1 loopback from R2. This was successful. Now, let's perform the same test from R1 to R2. The ping test has failed. Given this information, let's perform another simple and fundamental diagnostic operation. Let's check to see if this destination loopback interface is in the R1 routing table. And as we can see, the address is not in the R1 routing table. Let's review the entire routing table to see if there are any representative routes that would include the 172.16.102 prefix. Two such representative routes would be a summary route that includes the 172.16.102 prefix or a default route, and we see that neither one of those are here. As we can see, there is no representative route. Therefore, we see at least one problem with this iBGP neighbor relationship. R1 does not have a route to the R2 BGP update source. For some reason, OSPF is not advertising the 172.16.102 prefix to R1. Let's check the OSPF configuration on R2. As our troubleshooting process recommends, we will begin with a basic OSPF diagnostic tool. A good basic OSPF diagnostic tool to begin with is Show IP OSPF Interface Brief. This table reflects a problem. The R2 Loopback 102 interface should be listed in this table, but it's not. Let's examine the R2 running configuration and see if the 172.16.102 prefix has been assigned to OSPF. This could be done in two places. 
under the routing process or under the interface. Let's check the routing process first. As can be seen, there is no OSPF network statement for the 172.16.102 prefix. Therefore, OSPF must be enabled on loopback 102 or interface basis. Let's check this. It can be seen that OSPF has not been enabled on the loopback interface. There is an OSPF network type statement under the loopback interface, but no OSPF enabling commands. Let's add an interface OSPF enabling command on loopback 102. So now the 172.16.102 prefix on loopback 102 has been assigned to OSPF area 20. Let's verify this with the show IP OSPF interface command. Now we see the R2 loopback 102 interface in the OSPF interface table. If we go back to R1, we should now be able to ping the 172.16.102 address, and we should be able to verify that the IBGP neighbor relationship between R1 and R2 is operational. We can see that the pings are successful and the IBGB neighbor relationship is now operational. Our problem is solved and it was solved using a systematic troubleshooting approach using basic tools in the Cisco iOS toolkit. It must be noted that one major oversight occurred in the troubleshooting process just performed. This oversight can cause an extensive amount of wasted time and confusion. The oversight was this. When the initial ping tests were performed, they were performed without specifying a source address. When troubleshooting BGP neighbor relationships, it is always recommended that you explicitly specify the ping source address to reflect the local BGP update source address. This provides a more accurate BGP peer-to-peer -peer connectivity picture. Let's quickly demonstrate this between R2 and R1. For troubleshooting connectivity issues between BGP peers, always use the ping command with the source address option. Again, always use the ping command with the source address option. Make sure to reference the local BGP update source as the ping source address. Now that this problem is solved, let's move on to our next troubleshooting challenge. The 172.16.104 prefix needs to be learned by all BGP speakers in this topology. Let's start by checking to see if it is in the R1 BGP table. It is not. Let's check for this prefix in the next upstream router in the path. Again, when looking at our diagram, we just checked in R1, originated from R4, here's the 104 prefix here, the next upstream router would be R2. So let's check R2's BGP table. The prefix is not in the R2 BGP table either. Let's double check to make sure that R2 and R4 possess a fully operational BGP peering session. We see that they do. In fact, this session has been up for 3 days and 20 hours. Now let's check for the prefix in the R4 BGP table. R4 is the actual originator of this prefix. The 172.16.104 prefix must be in the R4 BGP table, or no other BGP speaker will possess it. It is not in the R4 BGP table either. This presents a major problem. It must be in the R4 BGP table because R4 is the originator of the route. Let's troubleshoot this problem by first reviewing some of our general troubleshooting principles. First, 
let's review our basic understanding of originating BGP routes. The first principle of originating BGP routes is a route that is to be originated by BGP must be used by the originating BGP speaker itself. In other words, a route that is originated by BGP must be in the local routing table of the originating BGP speaker. Let's check with this with the show IP route command. And we can see that the 172.16.104.22 prefix is in the routing table of R4. Therefore, the first requirement of originating BGP updates has been fulfilled. Next, let's check the BGP configuration itself. For two possible ways, the Cisco iOS software allows for originating BGP updates. One, the use of the network command, and two, via redistribution. We see that one of our two predicted Cisco iOS configuration options for originating BGP updates has been applied, the network command. However, the mask in the routing table is a 22-bit mask for the 172.16.104 prefix. Let's double check this. Now we can see the problem. As a rule, when the BGP network mask option is used to originate a BGP route, the network mask must exactly match the mask of the route in the routing table. As we can see, the mask specified with the BGP network configuration command is a 24-bit mask. However, for the 172.16.104 prefix, the routing table shows that it is actually using a 22-bit mask. Therefore, this must be changed to be configured as a 22-bit mask as well. Let's go ahead and make this change. We see that as soon as we added the network command with the correct mask, the prefix was added to the BGP table. Now let's more closely examine the show IP BGP table with the 172.16.104 prefix in it. Notice that the next top of this prefix is 0.0.0.0, .0 and also notice that the AS path is null or empty. These are the characteristics of a locally originated BGP route. To complete our verification process, let's apply the following two show commands, one on R4 and one on the next top router R2. This is a very useful show command. Show IP BGP neighbors advertised routes shows exactly what routes are being advertised from one BGP speaker to another. And as we can see, R4 is advertising the 172.16.104 prefix to R2. Now let's go to R2 and check to make sure the route was received. And the route was received. On a hop-by-hop -hop basis, the Cisco iOS verification tools are illustrating that BGP is operating as expected and predicted. Once the 172.16 prefix is received by R2 from R4, it has a next hop address of 172.16.34.4 and an AS path of 200. This is expected because both of these values are, by default, changed by the advertising eBGP speaker. By default, the advertising eBGP speaker sets the next top attribute and prepends its own AS to the AS path. This is exactly what has happened. It must also be noted that BGP by default selects one path for a specific prefix as the best path. 
In this particular case, because there is only one candidate path, there is only one choice for the best path. However, it must be stressed that PGP must select a route as the best path. This is indicated by the greater than symbol. Here is a symbol over here in the far left hand column in the BGP table. If a given prefix does not have at least one candidate route marked with the greater than symbol, there is a problem. As can be seen, everything is fine on R2. Let's make sure that R2 is advertising the 172.16.104 prefix to R1. Let's use our command show IP BGP neighbor advertised routes. And we see that R2 is in fact advertising the prefix to R1. And now let's review the R1 BGP table. In a structured manner, we're moving through this network on a BGP hop by hop basis attempting to examine each step of the BGP route installment and advertisement process. Again, we see on our screen now that R2 has advertised the route to R1. Now let's go and check to see if R1 has received the route. As soon as this BGP table entry is examined, a problem is immediately apparent. There is no greater than or best route symbol for this particular prefix. Therefore, BGP will not use this route locally and it will not advertise this route to its neighbors. Let's check this second point quickly. As we can see, R1 is not advertising any routes to R3. Let's troubleshoot this using one of the most powerful and yet simple of the BGP diagnostic tools. Show IP BGP with a specific prefix. In this case, the 172.16.104.22 prefix. This command will provide lots of details on this specific prefix. This ends part one of troubleshooting BGP routing. This will be resumed in part two of troubleshooting BGP routing. Welcome back to part two of troubleshooting BGP routing. We ended part one by entering show IP BGP, specifying the specific prefix of 172.16.104.22 on router R1. Now let's examine the contents of this output. As mentioned earlier, this command provides lots of useful information. First, it lists how many paths are available for this prefix and whether a best path has been selected. As we can see, it says no best path has been selected. Next, it shows that the prefix has not been advertised to any peer. Not advertised to any peer. Finally, it explicitly shows that the next top address is inaccessible. At this point, a moderate level of understanding of BGP should help solve the problem. This level of understanding of BGP should assist in comprehending when the BGP next top attribute is changed by default. As stated in part one of troubleshooting BGP routing, the default behavior of BGP is to have the next top attribute set only by the last advertising eBGP speaker and not by any iBGP speakers. The last advertising eBGP speaker in this path was R4. And when we review the network diagram, we see that R4 is not running any OSPF. Notice that R4 is not running any OSPF. Therefore, R1 has no routing information to reach R4. This can be verified by running ping tests between R1 and R4 and also by examining the routing table on R1. Let's perform this operation now. As can be seen, there is no routing information in the R1 routing table 
to reach the 172.16.34.4 address. We've identified the problem and we have an understanding of the problem. What are the possible solutions? Here are three possible solutions to the next stop reachability problem. One, configure the neighbor next stop self command on the upstream router. Two, configure a route map referencing a reachable next stop on the upstream router. Three, redistribute the route of the original next stop into the local routing domain. For this particular scenario, option one will be selected. Let's configure R2 with the neighbor next stop self command and associate this command with R1. Now let's go back to R1 and check its BGP table. This is much better. We now see that the 172.16.104 route has the necessary greater than symbol at the beginning of its BGP entry. This means that BGP has selected it as the best route. It will now be used in the local routing table and be advertised to downstream BGP neighbors, in this case R3. Let's check this. First, let's check the local routing table of R1. The 172.16.104 prefix is now in the R1 routing table. Please notice two unique characteristics of this routing table entry. First, notice how the BGP routing table entry only references a next hop and not an exit interface. This is because BGP is designed to forward packets to the next top AS and not necessarily the next top router on a common subnet. Forwarding packets to a next top router on a common subnet is the role of an IGP. Second, notice how the BGP next top address is the update source of the BGP speaker that advertised the route. In this case, 172.16.102.1. It is not the closest outgoing interface address of the upstream BGP speaker. In this case, that would be 172.16.12.2. With these points made, let's verify whether R1 will advertise this route to R3. We can see that it will not. Here is yet another problem to troubleshoot. Once again, let's begin this troubleshooting process with the very basic but powerful show IP BGP command. It is already known that the route has been selected as the best route by BGP. This is indicated by the greater than symbol. It should also be noted that show IP BGP lists this route as an internal BGP route. Notice the I over here on the far left. Given a basic understanding of the operation of BGP, it's recognized that an IBGP speaker will not advertise an IBGP learned route to another IBGP speaker unless it is configured as a route reflector or confederation peer. This is why this route is not being advertised. Let's remedy this problem by configuring one neighbor route reflector client command on R1. We notice that the route reflector client went down to reflect the configuration change, then it came back up. Now with this done, let's run the show IP BGP neighbor advertised routes command. R1 is now advertising the 172.16.104 prefix to R3 its other IBGP neighbor. Let's quickly verify that R3 has received the route and has installed the route in its BGP table as well as its local routing table.
First, let's enter show IP BGP. And the route is there. The greater than symbol is there. The next hop is 172.16.1021, which was set with next hop self. And the AS path is still 200. All of this looks fine. Now let's enter show IP route. And we see the 172.16.104 prefix has been successfully installed in the local routing table as well. At this point, all of our troubleshooting challenges have been solved by using a consistent troubleshooting process that involves the following four general steps. Step 1. Learn and master the technology you are troubleshooting. Step 2. Learn and master the troubleshooting tools that you will be using, namely Cisco IOS tools. Step 3. Be able to control and predict the behavior of the technology you are troubleshooting when you apply steps 1 and 2. And then finally, step 4. After you've completed steps 1 through 3, formulate a structured troubleshooting approach. Please consider using these four steps as general guidelines as you formulate your own troubleshooting procedures. This concludes this presentation on Troubleshooting BGP. Thank you. In this presentation, we encounter a series of troubleshooting scenarios that involve Border Gateway Protocol or BGP and aggregation issues. We will use the following topology. As can be seen, R4 is in Autonomous System 200, and it's advertising routes to R2 in AS100. AS100 is configured as a confederation with R1 and R2 in AS65001 and R3 in AS65002. In this scenario, R4 is a backbone router that's advertising a block of prefixes to R2. R2 wants to accept only the following range of prefixes from R4. The 172.16.20 through 172.16.23.0-24 block of prefixes and the 172.16.30 to 172.16.33.0-24 to block of prefixes. This policy is enforced by the following configuration statements entered on R2. We have two access list statements here. They're applied to this route map, and the route map is applied with this BGP neighbor statement. Despite this configuration, the following routes have been received by R2. As we can see, 20 through 23 has been received. That's good. But 28 through 31 have been received. That is contrary to our policy. Again, we were looking for 30 through 33. Again, we've received 28 through 31. Therefore, with the configuration above, R2 should have received only 8 routes, but it actually received 10 routes. Also, instead of receiving the 172.30 through 33 prefixes, as we've seen, it received the 172.16.28.0/24 prefix and the 172.16.29.0/24 prefix. Finally, R2 seems to have received two duplicate prefixes. Two 172.16.21 prefixes, one with a mask length of 24 and the other with a mask length of 25, and also a 22 prefix, again a mask length of 24 and a mask length of 25. Let's further analyze this problem with some show commands. Let's start with the show access list command on R2. When running the show command, the very first thing to notice is how access list number 2 does not list the prefix as 172.16.30 as it's displayed in the slide. Rather, it is displayed as 172.16.28. Here down here it's 172.16.28, but up here in the slide it was 172.16.30. Cisco iOS software made this change automatically because there is an overlap in the access list entered in the Cisco IOS software. In the access list in the slide, the prefix in access list 2, 172.16.30, 0, 
overlaps with the wildcard mask of 0.0.3.0. In the 172.16.30 prefix, the second to last bit is set to on. This same bit is set to on in the 0.0.3.0 wildcard mask. Cisco iOS software automatically corrected this by revising the statement to 172.16.28.0.0.3.0, as indicated down here by the console output. As a result, only the address block of 172.16.28.0 slash 24 through 172.16.31.0 slash 24 was received by R2. For learning and verification purposes, this can be vividly illustrated by enabling debug IP BGP updates on R2. Let's go ahead and do that. This debug output clearly shows what is going on. R4 advertised a set of addresses to R2 ranging from 172.16.18 through 172.16.23.0/24, as well as 172.16.28 through 172.16.33.0/24. While the first access list successfully blocked out the 172.16.18 and the 172.16.19.0/24 routes as desired, the second access list accidentally blocked out the 172.16.32 and the 172.16.33 prefixes and allowed the undesired 172.16.28 and 172.16.29.0/24 prefixes. And here we see that. 32 denied. 33 denied. We go up to here. We see 18 and 19 denied. So that was working as planned. But that this is not working according to our desired policy. 33 and 32 are denied. What has happened here is a common occurrence. An access list that works for one range of decimal numbers will not necessarily work for a similar range of decimal numbers. While access list 1 perfectly matches the range of addresses from 172.16.20.0 through 172.16.23.0/24, a similar access list does not match the similar decimal range of 172.16.30 through 172.16.33.0/24. It is always important to remember that while IP addresses are represented as decimal numbers, their underlying structure is binary. This is the cause of the problem for access list 2. It crosses the major bit boundary of 32. In order to permit only the range of addresses from 172.16.30.0/24 through 172.16.33.0/24, two access list statements need to be configured. Let's do this and verify what routes we receive from R4. Again, let's look at our current access list first. Okay, we're going to change this to have two statements. We will remove access list 2 and recreate it with a two-line access list that falls within the correct bit boundaries of 172.16.30.0 on all the way to 172.16.33.0/24. The first statement will permit only 172.16.30.0/24 and 172.16.31.0/24. The second statement will permit the addresses of 172.16.32.0/24 and 172.16.33.0/24. Let's go ahead and do this. Perfect, just as expected and predicted. 
the four undesired prefixes of 172, 16, 18, 19, 28, and 29 have been filtered out. We now have the desired blocks of addresses. We have verified this with our show IP BGP command. There they are, 20 through 23 and 30 through 33. It looks great. The good news is that only the desired range of addresses have been received. The bad news is that there are two additional slash 25 prefixes. One is here, and the other is here. These need to be filtered. Let's investigate. Once again, we will use the show access list command. The problem here is that we're using a standard access list. These commands match only on prefix and not on mask length. In order to create a filter that will also match on mask length, Cisco iOS software provides two options. 1. Configure an extended access list for prefix filtering, or 2. Configure a prefix list. Option 1, configuring an extended access list for prefix filtering, is not recommended by Cisco. Therefore, we will configure a prefix list to filter only the range of 172.16.20.0/24 through 172.16.23.0/24 and nothing more. Let's go ahead and do this. We've used the useful Cisco iOS show command, show IP BGP prefix list with the prefix list name, to test exactly what range of routes our prefix list will match. As the command indicates, this prefix list is too narrow and is therefore incorrectly configured. Let's adjust the prefix list with the same number of common bits that were specified in the standard access list, in this case 22 bits, and then add the greater than, or in Cisco iOS terminology, the GE option of 24. This is not correct either. The slash 25s are listed again. See the slash 25s? Let's add one more option to our prefix list the LE24 option. Perfect. This is exactly what we're looking for. As a general rule, it is highly recommended to always use prefix lists for prefix filtering. Also, please always remember to use both prefix list options of GE and LE to match a specific block of addresses that share an identical mask length. In our scenario, the options GE24 and LE24 were used to match all 172.16.20 prefixes that possess only a slash 24 mask length. After testing our prefix list with the show IP BGP prefix list command, let's add this prefix list to our route map and check our BGP table. Now we have our desired set of prefixes, exactly 20 through 23 slash 24 and 30 through 33 slash 24. Again, let's review our policy goals. We wanted 172.16.20.0 slash 24 through 172.16.23.0 slash 24 
and 172.16.30.0/24 through 172.16.33.0/24, and that's exactly what we have. This concludes part one of troubleshooting BGP filtering and aggregation issues. Welcome to part two of troubleshooting BGP filtering and aggregation issues. In part two, we will focus on troubleshooting BGP route aggregation issues. First, let's aggregate a range of 172.16.20.0/24 through 172.16.23.0/24 prefixes and advertise only the summary using the AS set option. Once this is configured, only this aggregate should be advertised to R1. R1 is the downstream BGP speaker. Before we create our aggregate route, let's perform a recommended preliminary step that should be performed before configuring any aggregate route at all. Let's double check for constituent longer matching routes in the local BGP table where the aggregate will be originated. In this case, this will be on R2. And we have that table here right now. And we see that we do have the constituent longer matching routes 172.16.20.0/24 through 172.16.23.0/24. Furthermore, we can get an exact match of these. Instead of using just show IP BGP, we can use a variation of the show IP BGP command. Let's go ahead and do that. Again, this is a very powerful tool for searching for longer matching constituent routes in a BGP table. As can be seen, there are many useful variations of the show IP BGP command. Also, as we can see, this BGP table contains exactly four constituent routes for this aggregate. This is optimal because our aggregate is a slash 22. With a slash 22 aggregate, precisely four contiguous prefixes will be matched in the third octet and the first of these contiguous four prefixes must be a multiple of four. Because the 172.16.20 prefix possesses a third octet that is a multiple of four, with a value of 20 in this case, the condition is met. Therefore, given an aggregate address with a slash 22-bit mask and a contiguous set of longer matching constituent routes where the third octet of the first route is a multiple of four, in this particular case, the 172.16.20.0-24 route, the desired aggregate address will not black hole any third octet prefixes. This is always a concern when configuring an aggregate address. When an aggregate is configured, an explicit effort must be made to assure that the aggregate is not overly broad and covers more address space than its constituent routes dictate. If an aggregate does this, then it could black hole traffic. This black hole condition can only be avoided by careful address allocation planning and deployment. Fortunately, this is not an issue with this scenario because our aggregate covers exactly the range of third octet address space in our BGP table. Let's now configure our aggregate on R2. We will configure it so that only the aggregate address is advertised to R1. To suppress the advertisement of longer matching constituent routes, the summary only option will be added to the aggregate command. As expected, all four of the longer matching prefixes contained within the aggregate address are suppressed. This is indicated by the S's on the far left hand column. Therefore, only the aggregate will be advertised to R1. Let's verify this with another very useful BGP show command.
As can be seen, R2 is advertising the aggregate to R1. For a final verification, let's go to R1 and check its BGP table. As we can see, the aggregate has been received by R1. And the Show IP BGP Display explicitly lists this BGP route as an aggregate. From a troubleshooting and verification perspective, remember the power of entering the Show IP BGP command, referencing an explicit prefix. When this is done, Cisco iOS software provides lots of useful detailed information on the specified prefix. Now, let's make one modification to our configuration. Before we do this, let's take one more look at our aggregate address in the R2 BGP table. Notice that all of the longer matching constituent routes have an AS200 in their AS path. However, the aggregate has nothing. This is the default behavior of an aggregate. By default, an aggregate has a null AS path. This behavior can be changed by adding the AS set configuration option to the aggregate command. When this is done, the aggregate will inherit all AS path information from its constituent routes. Let's go ahead and do this. And now we see the aggregate command with the AS set option. Now let's run the show IP BGP 172.16.20.0/22 command with the longer prefix option. Wonderful. Now the aggregate possesses AS200 in its AS path field as well. As a mere formality and to apply a consistent verification process. Let's run the show IP BGP neighbor advertise routes command to verify that R2 is advertising the aggregate to R1. What has happened? R2 is no longer advertising the aggregate of R1. The only change that was made was the AS set option was added to the aggregate command. How could this have blocked the advertisement of the aggregate? Let's begin our investigation with the very powerful show IP BGP command while specifying the aggregate prefix. Remember, the show IP BGP command provides lots of detailed information on a specific prefix when a specific prefix is listed with the command. This is very interesting. Somehow, when the AS set command was added to our aggregate statement, the BGP community no advertise was also added. Because the aggregate now possesses this community, the aggregate will not be advertised to any other peer. If this aggregate is to be advertised again, the community no advertise string must be removed. Therefore, when the BGP AS set option is added to the aggregate command, it appears that the aggregate inherits more than just the AS path attribute information from its longer matching constituent routes. It appears that it also inherits the community attribute from its longer matching constituent routes. Now we must determine which of the four longer matching constituent routes contains the community no advertise string. Fortunately, Cisco iOS software provides a tool to quickly narrow down which BGP prefixes contain communities. This tool is yet another option of the show IP BGP command. It looks like Cisco iOS software has identified the problematic constituent route. It appears to be the 172.16.23.0/24 route. Let's take a closer look at this prefix. Yes, this is the prefix that contains the community no advertise string. It's displayed right here. With this identified, the solution to this problem is to configure an advertise map on R2 and exclude the 172.16.23 prefix from the aggregate. Please note that this must be done only when the AS set option is used with an aggregate command. 
When the AS set option is used, the aggregate inherits both the AS path information from the longer matching constituent routes and, surprisingly, community strings as well. Please be aware of this. Let's now modify our configuration of R2 with the appropriate advertised map. As we can now see, the community no advertised string has been removed from the aggregate. Now, let's check the show IPBGP neighbor advertised routes output. The aggregate now appears in this table with the AS path of 200. Therefore, our problem has been solved. This concludes Part 2 of Troubleshooting BGP, Filtering and Aggregation. We will resume this presentation with Part 3, which will focus on troubleshooting AS path filtering issues. Welcome to Part 2 of Troubleshooting BGP Filtering and Aggregation Issues. In Part 2, we will focus on troubleshooting BGP route aggregation issues. First, let's aggregate a range of 172.16.20.0-24 through 172.16.23.0-24 prefixes and advertise only the summary using the AS set option. Once this is configured, only this aggregate should be advertised to R1. R1 is the downstream BGP speaker. Before we create our aggregate route, let's perform a recommended preliminary step that should be performed before configuring any aggregate route at all. Let's double check for constituent longer matching routes in the local BGP table where the aggregate will be originated. In this case, this will be on R2. And we have that table here right now. And we see that we do have the constituent longer matching routes 172.16.20.0/24 through 172.16.23.0/24. Furthermore, we can get an exact match of these. Instead of using just show IPBGP, we can use a variation of the show IPBGP command. Let's go ahead and do that. Again, this is a very powerful tool for searching for longer matching constituent routes in a BGP table. As can be seen, there are many useful variations of the show IP BGP command. Also, as we can see, this BGP table contains exactly four constituent routes for this aggregate. This is optimal because our aggregate is a slash 22. With a slash 22 aggregate, precisely four contiguous prefixes will be matched in the third octet and the first of these contiguous four prefixes must be a multiple of four. Because the 172.16.20 prefix 
possesses a third octet that is a multiple of 4, with a value of 20 in this case, the condition is met. Therefore, given an aggregate address with a slash 22-bit mask and a contiguous set of longer matching constituent routes where the third octet of the first route is a multiple of 4, in this particular case the 172.16.20.0 slash 24 route, the desired aggregate address will not black hole any third octet prefixes. This is always a concern when configuring an aggregate address. When an aggregate is configured, an explicit effort must be made to assure that the aggregate is not overly broad and covers more address space than its constituent routes dictate. If an aggregate does this, then it could black hole traffic. This black hole condition can only be avoided by careful address allocation planning and deployment. Fortunately, this is not an issue with this scenario because our aggregate covers exactly the range of third octet address space in our BGP table. Let's now configure our aggregate on R2. We will configure it so that only the aggregate address is advertised to R1. To suppress the advertisement of longer matching constituent routes, the summary only option will be added to the aggregate command. As expected, all four of the longer matching prefixes contained within the aggregate address are suppressed. This is indicated by the S's on the far left hand column. Therefore, only the aggregate will be advertised to R1. Let's verify this with another very useful BGP show command. As can be seen, R2 is advertising the aggregate to R1. For a final verification, let's go to R1 and check its BGP table. As we can see, the aggregate has been received by R1. And the show IP BGP display explicitly lists this BGP route as an aggregate. From a troubleshooting and verification perspective, remember the power of entering the show IP BGP command, referencing an explicit prefix. When this is done, Cisco iOS software provides lots of useful detailed information on the specified prefix. Now, let's make one modification to our configuration. Before we do this, let's take one more look at our aggregate address in the R2 BGP table. Notice that all of the longer matching constituent routes have an AS200 in their AS path. However, the aggregate has nothing. This is the default behavior of an aggregate. By default, an aggregate has a null AS path. This behavior can be changed by adding the AS set configuration option to the aggregate command. When this is done, the aggregate will inherit all AS path information from its constituent routes. Let's go ahead and do this. And now we see the aggregate command with the AS set option. Now let's run the show IP BGP 172.16.20.0 slash 22 command with the longer prefix option. Wonderful. Now the aggregate possesses AS200 in its AS path field as well. As a mere formality and to apply a consistent verification process, Let's run the show IP BGP neighbor advertise routes command to verify that R2 is advertising the aggregate to R1. What has happened? 
R2 is no longer advertising the aggregate of R1. The only change that was made was the ASSET option was added to the aggregate command. How could this have blocked the advertisement of the aggregate? Let's begin our investigation with the very powerful show IPBGP command while specifying the aggregate prefix. Remember, the show IPBGP command provides lots of detailed information on a specific prefix when a specific prefix is listed with the command. This is very interesting. Somehow, when the ASSET command was added to our aggregate statement, the BGP community no advertise was also added. Because the aggregate now possesses this community, the aggregate will not be advertised to any other peer. If this aggregate is to be advertised again, the community no advertise string must be removed. Therefore, when the BGP ASSET option is added to the aggregate command, it appears that the aggregate inherits more than just the ASPath attribute information from its longer matching constituent routes. It appears that it also inherits the community attribute from its longer matching constituent routes. Now we must determine which of the four longer matching constituent routes contains the community no advertise string. Fortunately, Cisco iOS software provides a tool to quickly narrow down which BGP prefixes contain communities. This tool is yet another option of the show IP BGP command. It looks like Cisco iOS software has identified the problematic constituent route. It appears to be the 172.16.23.0/24 route. Let's take a closer look at this prefix. Yes, this is the prefix that contains the community no advertise string. It's displayed right here. With this identified, the solution to this problem is to configure an advertise map on R2 and exclude the 172.16.23 prefix from the aggregate. Please note that this must be done only when the ASSET option is used with an aggregate command. When the ASSET option is used, the aggregate inherits both the ASPath information from the longer matching constituent routes and surprisingly, community strings as well. Please be aware of this. Let's now modify our configuration of R2 with the appropriate advertise map. As we can now see, the community no advertise string has been removed from the aggregate. Now, let's check the show IPBGP neighbor advertise routes output. The aggregate now appears in this table with the AS path of 200. Therefore, our problem has been solved. This concludes part two of troubleshooting BGP, filtering and aggregation. We will resume this presentation with part three, which will focus on troubleshooting AS path filtering issues.
Welcome to part 3 of troubleshooting BGP filtering and aggregation issues. Let's now look at a final problem in this presentation. It involves an ASPath filtering problem on R3. R3 is over here. So routes originate from R4, come to R2, go to R1, and then end at R3. For policy reasons, R3 is supposed to receive only routes from R1 that contain the Confederation sub-AS number of 65001 and nothing else. To fulfill this requirement, R3 was configured with the following ASPath access list statement. This has been applied to an inbound filter list on R3. For some reason, this filter does not work. This filter is blocking all updates from R1. Let's troubleshoot this problem. We will begin with the show IP BGP command on R3. As can be seen, there are no routes in the BGP table of R3. Let's perform some debugging. This illustrates the power of the debug utility. Debug IP BGP updates explicitly states that all routes from 172.16.12.1 are denied due to a filter list. Over here it says on the far right hand side a filter list. We will now use the show IP BGP regular expression command. First, let's remove the filter list so that we can receive some BGP routes to perform our analysis. And we can see that only the 172.16.102 prefix meets our matching criteria of containing only the sub-AS number of 65001 in its AS path. Let's use the show IPBGP regular expression command to see what regular expression will match only this AS path. First, let's apply the regular expression that is contained within the original AS path access list. Let's double check this first. This is a very simple regular expression. Literally interpreted, it will match exactly a five character string composed of 65001 and that is all. Let's apply this to the show IP BGP regular expression command. We will do this because sometimes regular expressions can be corrupted with hidden characters when they are entered in the Cisco iOS configuration mode. No output was generated. Therefore, there must be something wrong with this very simple regular expression. To troubleshoot this problem, let's take a step back and enter a much broader regular expression. Let's remove the caret and dollar sign special characters and see what output is generated. All routes containing 65,001 are returned. In this particular scenario, there are only six routes. It appears that the problem has to do with the parentheses symbols around the sub-AS number of 65001. Confederation subautonomous systems are enclosed within parentheses. Let's apply the regular expression using the parentheses. Once again, it returns all routes containing 65001. Now, let's add only one of the special regular expression characters used before. Let's use the beginning of string character only, the caret symbol. We are attempting to be very incremental in our troubleshooting process. Now we are back to a failure situation. The problem seems to be related to how the regular expression engine interprets the parentheses symbol. Perhaps this is because the parentheses symbol is also a special character used by the regular expression engine. 
Parentheses are used by the regular expression engine to group a string of characters. In this specific case, we are not using the parentheses to group characters. We're using the parentheses as a literal string to represent a private AS within a confederation. When a character like the parenthesis symbol need to be literally interpreted by a regular expression engine, the symbol should be preceded by the regular expression escape character, the backslash. Let's go ahead and do this. As we can see, this worked. Even though Cisco iOS software gave us an error message about an unmatched regular expression pair of the parentheses, this output indicates that the first parentheses symbol, the left parentheses, is no longer interpreted as a regular expression special symbol. To remove this error message, all we need to do is to add a second backslash before the right parentheses. Now we're making progress in our troubleshooting effort. We're now matching all routes that begin with the Confederation sub-AS 65001. Our backslashes are working. Now all we need to do is add our regular expression end of string symbol, the dollar sign, and we will match prefixes that only contain Confederation sub-AS 65001. Now our problem is solved. The problem was solved by using the correct tools from the Cisco iOS Troubleshooting Toolkit in an incremental manner. We began with a very broad and simple regular expression. We then incrementally made the regular expression more complex and tested it with each and every incremental change. In conclusion, it is useful to remember these general troubleshooting AS path filtering rules. 1. Start with a very broad regular expression string and then incrementally add to its complexity. Two, with each addition to your regular expression, your set of matched lines should be getting smaller. Three, when your regular expression works correctly with the show IP BGP regular expression command, but does not work in the configuration, manually remove the statement from the configuration and carefully re-enter it manually. These types of strings can often get corrupted when entered into a router. This concludes this presentation. As a review, we encountered three types of troubleshooting scenarios in this presentation. In Part 1, we encountered a prefix filtering problem. In Part 2, an aggregation problem. And in Part 3, an AS path filtering problem. All three of these problems were minimally described. While the problems in this presentation varied, a consistent use of the Cisco iOS Toolkit was applied along with a consistent problem-solving approach. Thank you.